G'day. Welcome, everyone. Hello. I am Big Dino Paints, painting here for Word Miniatures, doing this leg. I know it sounds very unexciting, but this leg is going to be an exciting paint job, I promise. Uh, this leg actually belongs to this giant robot, which is very cool. Um, and I actually ripped a little bit of the box off, this, this box art here, so I can talk a bit about um, some of the concepts that I'm that I'm going for uh, when I'm painting this and, and talk about stuff. So we'll come back to this um, rather than trying to do the whole model. This is going to be more of a demonstration stream than a finishing a model. <laughs> uh, we, we're actually going to try and talk a little bit more about um, understanding the volumes and and how non-metallic metal technique works a little bit and hopefully I can do a reasonable job of explaining that so um, when I when I start uh, painting metal uh, I try to do it over over a black um, and if you've seen a lot of the other pieces that I um, paint I'll have a, a zenithal prime a white or gray prime um, but when I'm about to do non-metallic metal I'll usually um, repaint that area in black so I can start from a black base and the reason for that number one most important reason uh, for non-metallic metal I'm going to try and write stuff up here uh, you need to have uh, high contrast boom number one so the way we achieve high contrast is by going from black all the way up to very close to white. So we're going to start with um, blocking out uh, where we where we want to visualise the light um, to be hitting. So um, I'm probably going to do a lot of drawings today. <laughs> so I apologise if that's boring for you, but it's an important thing. Hello, Dr. Rathnard. Welcome, mate. Uh, so. When we, when we highlight you know, normal surfaces, normal objects, what you tend to think about um, is the direction of the light source. Um, and that's the most obvious and, and logical thing to think about, right? So, uh, you know, if we have a rounded object and you're standing uh, and the light's coming from the top down, then we highlight this area, right? That is, that is the most logical uh, simple and obvious thing to do however when we're talking about non-metallic metal we actually have to change that slightly and the reason we have to change it is because uh, light reflects off metal uh, based on where you are as a viewer so let's look at this object again and let's assume that this here is our eye line so this is your your little eyeball here oh hello here's our human eye so rather than uh, the light being on top as you would imagine that we're that we're seeing it from uh, we move it based on uh, where these two lines will intersect so the light and your vision and so what you actually tend to see is the light highlight being here instead so it's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. And so the reason I'm demonstrating this first is because it's important to understand where we're placing the highlights changes when we're trying to replicate or represent metal. So uh, I'm not gonna make a note of that, but the next note I'm gonna make is um, this is important for uh, objects. So when you do non-metallic metal, it's important that you break down each object in, into a, uh, a, a surface so that you can understand how the light's gonna react. And we'll start here with this leg. So this is the, uh, this is the right leg, so the left-hand side from our view. Um, and we're gonna assume that our light is coming from the top right of our model so we're going to be coming from this direction 
Uh, and so when we have a cylinder, what we tend to see is uh, a line across the center of the cylinder. So again, this is a different uh, concept to how we would normally consider uh, highlighting an object. Um, because if we've got light coming from the top, you know, we're going to think about highlighting this line here. So the cylinder has a highlight directly uh, in line with the angle. And if we again assume that we're the, we're the viewer, um, this is where this is going to be placed. So the second thing you, you see on objects um, like this cylinder is little, little reflective lights, a little bounce lights. So they're usually running along the same sort of trajectory. So this is uh, a little reflective bounce light that we've got happening alongside our non-metallic metal. So to go back to point two, objects, you need to think about how light will reflect from this object. And the way we do that is by considering breaking down each section into a, into an object. So this, we're considering that a cylinder. Here, we're considering that a sphere. And so when we do a sphere, we want to have a, a highlight, a high value, a light point, as if it was a spherical object. And so when you have a sphere, you see these gigantic uh, lights hitting you right on this spot. And then we don't tend to see much light elsewhere. So this step that we're, that we're working on now is very conceptual. So what we're trying to achieve is, a, is an understanding of the light and make sure that we know where we want the light to be, how it's going to interact on each surface, and what changes we need to make so that it looks good because it doesn't matter if you get everything perfect and according to all of the rules if it looks really bad then it doesn't matter so this step is about visualizing how the surface is going to look where the lights are going to be ending up and make sure that we're happy with that so break down the surface into objects. Third step, brush, strokes. I'm pretty loose when it comes to direction or to, to brush strokes, I tend to be brush strokes every which way. But it is an important part of this technique because Brush strokes that are coming along the wrong angle will take you out of the illusion. It's very important that the brush strokes are consistent with the surface because it's a big part of it looking like metal. So this is why you can see my uh, very conscious and intentional direction of brush stroke along this line so we are we are going to try for some rusty metal effects now which is why on my palette you can see i've got oranges and reds um but uh, the colors that i'm using at the moment are some of my go-to colors for um, non-metallic metal but i'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the reason why these colors are my go-to and what what is actually happening when we're using them. So the color that we're, that we're using here is a blue-ish gray. And the reason we're using a bluish gray is because metal being a highly reflective surface will always reflect the environment around it. And the environment you get most commonly reflected on metal is actually the sky because the sky is uh, extremely visible outside. So the reason we're choosing a blue-gray is 
because that allows us to reinforce the, the light, the sky, and being outside. Uh, we're going to introduce a second color into this process. And the color you can see is actually all over my paintbrush because I just got paint all over me, which is awesome. Uh, but that second color we're going to introduce is uh, green. Uh, now I've chosen a pretty uh, magical green as opposed to like an earthy green because I like magical colors. But we're not going to use the green from above because it doesn't make any sense. We're going to use the green from below. So here, what we're starting to talk about is the second type of light that you see on metallic surfaces, which is what I like to call bounce light. Other people call it different things. But if we want to talk about this um, example again, uh, the light is bouncing from above here. And then it is bouncing backwards onto the underneath of our object. Go back, Frog Jim. And so this light that we're highlighting now is actually here. So again, there's there's a thought process behind the where, the why, that I'm trying to explain as I go here. But this is a lot of uh, different concepts that are usually um, not easy to grasp without some some significant practice so I'm confident you can all do it though so this is a noticeable color difference between those two the green and the blue um, Again, we're thinking about the light reflecting up from underneath. And so we're going to use this green on uh, this underside. And a little bit here. Yes, mate. Yes, they indeed let me back on. They couldn't get anyone else to fill the 7 a.m. time slot, mate. So. Just lucky, lucky for me. So as I said very, very early on, this step is a conceptual step. We're trying to understand all of these little bits, where the light is, the reflections and so on and so forth. So it doesn't have to be perfect at this juncture. We really just want to get a, an absolute sense of the shapes that we're dealing with. So the next uh, thing that's going to join my list of great tips is edges. So the way that uh, light will often work along these metallic surfaces is it will catch the edges and you'll get a reflection along that sharp edge of, a, of an object of the surface. So we want to try and replicate that um, light being reflected feeling. And the way we do that is by highlighting those edges very sharply, very precisely. I haven't mixed maybe a little bit too much water there.
I'm not getting enough uh, coverage. G'day, Mick Bluff. Welcome, champion. All right. So this is this is the start of our approach. So again, cylinder. Again, thinking about the direction. Again, considering how the object is going to react. Thinking about brush strokes and so on. Uh, I will invariably do some airbrush my friend because that is my technique but it is it is something you can do without an airbrush you don't need an airbrush to be able to do the blending step okay i'm gonna i'm gonna basically move on from there maybe just this little bit down here actually So we're starting to see the, the shape coming coming out. It's not uh, looking like metal yet. That's okay. Let's hope it does. So you can see we're leaving the high contrast, so we're leaving the black. We're thinking about how each object interacts with our position as a viewer and, when, and where the direction of the light source is. We're being cognizant of our brush strokes, the direction of the brush strokes, and we're making sure that we highlight the edges. So we're going to now move into the more traditional, or the, I guess, traditional approach of highlighting and leaving a, a little bit of the previous color underneath showing traditional layering. But again, brush strokes, crucial. Think about the direction of your strokes. Don't do what I just did there. Hopefully no one saw that. <laughs> Break my rules. So all of this, all of this rough, sketchy, sort of um, texturing. You know, on a normal on a normal paint job, you you, you sort of think to yourself, oh, you don't want to see that. Um, you know, that, that's that's rough and creates an unfinished look. And it can do, yep, absolutely. We're going to fix it a little bit with my airbrush blending. Again, you can fix it with your brush as well. But if you ever have a look at metal, burnished metal, the types of metal that you see in armors and that sort of thing, you do see uh, those little lines in the metal. You see those those shapes um, where they've, whether that's ground the steel down or you know what whatever that it is they've done, but it's actually created um, those striations in the metal. And so the positive of retaining these brush strokes in in uh, is it reinforces that effect of the type of object that it is. So that's why I go back to brush strokes as being important for this because it helps sell the illusion of metal. So again, we're using the we're using the blue here, the blue gray, and really focusing on where we think the light was going to land based on our previous steps. But as we start to build up those volumes, we can start to go uh, and add some little corrections or um, improvements. Uh, as we just did here along this edge, and then potentially also add some little micro details. So let's go up a little bit more down here and a 
let's actually do this a little bit there. So we've fused the two colors together here, the green from the underground and the blue from the sky. And let's hope it looks good. I'm sure it will, probably. Now this, this, as I said at the start, is, is a pretty advanced uh, sort of technique. I've done some on my previous streams here. I've done some pretty quick and dirty non-metallic metal. I haven't really dived into it uh, in this much detail. Um, so this is hopefully a little bit more in depth than what I normally I've done on this this wonderful stream before. Hopefully you can see that the same techniques that I've used on all of the other figures and paint jobs that I've done uh, are the same techniques and uh, approaches that I use on this. The only difference is we would be a little bit more aware of brush strokes and build up a few more layers, so on. Thank you, Fluff. Yep. Uh, you think it looks rad now? Wait till we get a little bit more progress, mate. It's going to blow your brain. Cool. So now you start to see and, and visualize, you know, metal starting to feel a little bit more uh, correct, so on. So I'm going to, again, reintroduce a little bit of the green again. It's an emerald color. I like this emerald color. <laughs> Thank you, Frog Jim. Checks in the mail. Okay, so the next step is we're going to start to introduce grey tones into the colour. And that is because even though we perceive a lot of environmental colours in metal, metal is grey. So without grey tones in this metal, it doesn't really look right. And we're going to try and do rusty metal. So, But before we do rusty metal, I'm going to showcase how we do normal metal and then we're going to rustify it afterwards rustify now rustify now rustify so this is gray mixed in with a little bit of the blue um and we are starting to think very carefully now about where those lights are going to hit and make sure that we're really reinforcing that that light source. Uh, how much do I worry about the bounce lights? Well, I don't tend to worry about much, mate, particularly when it comes to painting toy soldiers. Worry is not the right word. Um, how much do I think about where they go? Uh, I think a little bit, but I don't think as much as I used to because you can, you can get away with pretty much anything because, as I said at the start, Non-metallic metal uh, so dependent on your position as a viewer as to whether it looks right or not. And if you if you turn a model and you go, wow, this now looks really bad from that direction, that's because all of the highlights have been placed in a specific way. One of the real skills in miniature painting is being able to get a model to look good from multiple angles with non-metallic metal. There are people who can do that. And I'm not one of those people. And I say kudos to those who can. All right. So 
I remind you. Ice strikes. Important. Now at this point, you can switch to a smaller brush um, to really start to remind uh, people of these these lights. And at this point, I am also going to add uh, something which I'm going to write about in a second, but it is an important one. No, no object in the type of environments that we tend to paint models in uh, is ever going to last very long with a clean, perfect surface. And so that is why uh, adding texture, adding different points of interest on your models, uh, for me, is just a, like a crucial part of adding some life and adding some some real genuine visual interest um, now with this model we're adding texture um, with our brush strokes but we also want to make sure that we're adding little bits of texture along the way to help us remind the viewer that this is a real object that exists in a real environment that has had some had some shit happen now you can see here that I'm adding a few lines and, and highlights in areas where I haven't done any bounce lights and that's okay um, when we do a little bit of harmonizing and, and changing things with the airbrush it's going to it's going to help bring all these areas together some areas it's okay if there's a little bit less of this additional detail uh, we'll be able to bring it all together in the final wash up, big demo hopes. <laughs> so again, there's gray, grays and blues mixed together. There's a myriad of colors you can use for this don't have to use these colors and that's one of the things I sometimes try to avoid doing intentionally is talking about colors because um, the types of colors that you use can sometimes constrain you into thinking that that's the only way you can paint a certain surface like these are the only colors you can use to paint metals not true you can use whatever colors you want it's, it's more about understanding the object and the surface and placing those lights in the right spot to really what you need to do for metal. Uh, I don't use a foam brush personally. Um, I don't tend to paint a lot of texturing uh, on objects that I paint with a caveat. I have, of course, done texturing. But if I'm going to do that type of texturing, I usually use different techniques like uh hairspray weathering or salt weathering um, yeah, that's the techniques i've used in the past to get a really uh texture um but yeah there's 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 value in using that type of tool um, uh, and it's it's the one of the things that I talk a lot about, uh, natural variation. Sometimes the way our brains work, one of the hardest things we ever try and do is paint things that look irregular. <laughs> yeah. Our brain is always just like neating things up and keep everything organized and make sure that things are balanced. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm an absolute fiend for it. If I see something that is uh, like freckles, for example. Yes, paint a freckle on one side of the cheek. Uh, you know, yeah, better better paint a freckle on the other side, or it'll be unbalanced. 
So you do, but then you're like, oh, hang on a second. Better put another freckle over here. Oh, yes, yes, more freckles. Wonderful. And then all of a sudden, you've just got like five freckles all in the same spots on opposite sides, and it looks unnatural. It looks weird. It's freckles and not just freckles, but natural objects, natural things like rust. Being able to paint that unnatural, unusual thing is the key. Uh, let's actually just go a little bit of greeny under here, a little bit of greeny. Great. All right, so I'm sure you would agree that it is looking a lot more like metal at this juncture. Let's dive into pure grey, and then we'll do some whites. Yep, the curse of symmetry. So yes, a foam brush would be great to bypass that issue. Uh, all right, so let's be very considered now with this. And I remind you all at this point, if you're following along, the rules that we're following are written over here. But these are just the rules that I've written for myself, for my approach. There's many ways you can paint non-metallic metal. I'm sure there are many ways that you can paint it that is uh, cooler and better than this. Don't feel like these rules are the only way you can do things. You can do whatever you want. It's your hobby. Have fun. But I was always taught that you need to know and understand the rules before you can break them. Because you need to understand the consequences of breaking them. All right, so at this at this little position here, uh, what I've what I've just done is incorporated another important element, which is one that's going to make the list. In a second, here it is. Writing it down again. I'm writing down vacuum which is a weird thing to write, but I'll explain it. Uh, especially with metal, with any miniature painting, it's important to remember that no object exists in a vacuum. Nothing is just floating out there in the empty nothingness of space, except for maybe space, some other things, spaceships. But nothing exists by itself on this model. And what I mean by that is when I'm painting a surface, such as this little ball-shaped sphere on his leg, uh, we have to remember that there is actually another reflecting metal surface right beside it. And so we're going to have light coming down off this piece of metal and bouncing off this other piece of metal and bouncing around bouncing around all over the place and talking to each other. So all of a sudden you have a wonderful, joyous conglomeration of all of these objects just having a great little time, chin wagging to each other. Look at all of these things. So the reason I talk about that, about objects not existing in a vacuum, is you have to constantly remember that if you have a surface adjacent to another surface, those two surfaces have to feel connected somehow. So if you are dealing with uh, metal beside a fabric that is bright and intense and vibrant, such as red or purple or green, you need to incorporate some of that color into your metal because the two things will talk to each other visually. same exists for two metal objects sitting side by side, they will talk to each other. They do not exist in a vacuum. So this line is my very weak attempt at telling these two guys, let's be friends. All right, 
we start to look more like metal now. We start to feel a little bit more like everything is reflecting and glinting, but it's usually these last few steps where you see your metal start to come to life. In all seriousness, it's, it's usually right at the end that it's like a tap gets turned on and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, Big Ten has the best. That's what I say to myself when I'm doing it, but you'd obviously probably want to say something different if you're doing this. Oh, yeah, Frog Jim wants to be like Big Ten. You know, something like that. Or whatever. Yeah, please yourself. Frog Jim. Head like a butcher's apron over here. Very ordinary. All right, cool. So when I look at this this leg, what I see is this this area here feeling not as uh, correct as this area here. Now that's actually okay because if we think about it from a light perspective, we've got a light coming from above. This is brighter. This is darker. That all makes sense. When we get to our uh, highlight, our final steps um, and our airbrush steps, we will help all of that feel more correct. So this is the next step. We're going to do a, a light, and this should be when it starts to feel like metal. If it doesn't doesn't start looking like metal, well, don't blame me. It's someone else's fault. Now, if it doesn't look like metal, it probably means that your light placements haven't been correct. You need to go back to step one and think about where those elements need to be reflecting light. It's tricky. It's a tricky. It's a tricky surface tricky to conceptualize but when you get it oof, satisfying so if you recall I went in and added some texture before with these little scratches um, we're going to do some more of that we're going to reinforce those areas Again, Wasn't sure if you're back, but I thought that's a good way for me to find out that you're back. Okay. Congratulations to the winners of the painting competition. The little winners will be announced today or something, will they? Okay, so this is this is a, a stage that we might leave the metal brushwork 
and we're going to move into a little bit of airbrush. So the advantage of the airbrush is multiple, multiple things, especially for this. Using an airbrush for this uh, surface will help reinforce the illusion of it being metal, because metal glints and has little pops of light and just looks really cool. And an airbrush is great for that. So we're going into a really bright, uh, high value color. I won't go into explaining too much about values and so forth, because I've done that in a lot of my other streams. But let's have a look at this. A little bit more pressure. Take the pressure up. So this is a value we're looking at. It's pretty bright. And so we're going to focus this along our lines that we've done highlights on. But we're okay with a bit of overspray because that's going to help the glint. have an object that feels very metallic because we've got these glints and everything feels pretty good but you can see we've still got those uh, contrasts happening the light to dark contrast and you can also still definitely see the brush strokes which is why first of all you can't just do this with an airbrush second of all Uh, why we want to leave them there. Get a sim hell. So let's try uh, adding some more environmental colors into this and darkening it up a little bit. So we might use a contrast paint for this. I'm going to use this one, which is the first time I've used it, which is great. This is a new one. And we might add some of oh, this one. Yeah. So I use contrast paints a lot for uh, a few tasks, but the main one is actually this. It's re adding uh, saturation or intensity of color back into uh, a paint job. Well, a little bit more of this. Yeah, cool. So. Uh, when we look at this, it looks washed out. It looks a little bit pastel. Appreciate the uh, white balance a little bit off, exposure a little bit off, but it's, it is quite white. So we're going to add this color into the paint job, which is going to bring visual interest back create that interesting glints and glazes and so on and so forth. You can do that in a variety of ways, but for me, that's just a very easy, straightforward way to do it. Sibel, I personally am doing gloriously. Um, I can't speak for the other people in the chat, but I'm sure they're also doing gloriously as well. All right, that is all the airbrushing we're going to do for the moment. But I think you can already see, sorry, is my hair dryer. Great tip. Sorry for the noise. Uh, cool. So you can already see how much, you know, that, that's improved this object to look like metal. You can see the little bits of glint helping. But we'll go back to point number one, high contrast. We've lost a little bit of that, that value that we did have. 
So we're going to re-add some of that black. Um, so I'm going to take my, my brush and I'm going to place it in all the areas where the undersides would be and also really clearly delineating objects. It is, it is early indeed, friends. I appreciate you all stopping by. It's late for me. <laughs> that sounds like must watch television. Young Wallander. dive too much more into this black lining because we are going to rust this all up but you can see uh, the impact particularly on this this object here that this this black lining type of uh, effect will have it really helps uh, bring you back into this object being a metal object because you've got that high contrast the white all the way up to the black so let's uh let's add a few little things great all right so my final step in my glorious process is going back in and re-adding a high value high contrast highlight these little sparkle lights as i like to call them these will always uh, help sell the illusion. And I just use the same color I used for the glaze previously because it's a, um, it's a brush instead of an airbrush. So you get a much uh, poppier, brighter white. Cool. So as I said before, many, many ways you can do non-metallic metal. This is just my way, which I have refined over approximately three days of painting this week because it changes all the time. <laughs> nah, not really. But yeah. It's a it's a technique that is based in some specific uh, concepts and rules about how light interacts with these objects. But as I said, right back at the start, there's many, many ways you can approach this. There's many ways to skin a cat. You, know, you see people who use blue and brown and green and represent lights from uh, the sky and all sorts of crazy stuff. I can't do that, friends. I'm not going to be able to show you how to do that. I apologize in advance. Cool. All right. So that's a that's an example of this uh, metal. Now you can continue to refine that. You know, if I was if I was wanting to push this more into looking like really steel, 
I'd probably go in and add some more blues, probably with the, with the airbrush, you know, really darken it up in some areas, start to lean in more on this green. Uh, maybe we might do that anyway, just to show you. We might use this, this green. So because we've already built in the green color as being different, we'll actually use a completely different green. And this will just help tint the, that area with a little bit more variation. Fun, fun, fun. Looking forward to the weekend. It's Friday, Friday. Got to get down on Friday. It's actually not Friday. It's, uh, it's Wednesday. Uh, yep. This green. How good. Cool. All right. Uh, I, I just love the airbrush for this for this tool, for this technique. Allows you to do some really quick adjustments without losing the shape of what you've already done. All right. There we go. So let's go in now and start to rustify. Now rustify. <laughs> All right, so I've got a dirty old brush. Uh, some bristles that are all askew and there's bits and things in it. So with rust, uh, rust follows the policy we talked about before. It's a natural occurring phenomenon. That means it is very un irregular and unplanned. However, it does follow some specific rules. And those rules are, um, it follows the direction of water so if you would be having uh, water running down the rivulets of your leg, then you're likely to get rust streaking from areas where uh, water would collect um, and you'll get streaks like this. Yeah. I'm using this big old brush. Um, we're going to go for a relatively rusty look here. Um, so again, um, I'm not going to talk too much about colours, but this is a this is a darkish red, uh, sort of a coppery coloured red, brownie red, and we're going to be um, using this this brush and stabbing twisting and stabbing to create irregularities that it's very hard to replicate with just your just your brush. Um, we want to see different little little shapes appearing um, changing up my the bristles and twisting the bristles around and I'm actually using a relatively dilute paint at the moment. We want we want to just build this up in some stages. So you can see this rust when it first goes on, it looks very noticeable and obvious. But as we um, as it dries, it starts to soften, which is cool because it allows us to build this up in stages. Great. So we'll switch to a more vibrant orange now, a more rusty looking rust. I might even call it a Russell Crow, Rustal Crow, Rusty Trombone. Don't call it that.
Mm. Got into a very long conversation about 40 year old virgin yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Pretend I didn't say that. Uh, and how much I love that movie. So the advantage of this approach of doing all of the metal and then coming in and adding your rust is that you can add rust and add streaks and grime and effects and the rest of the lighting and everything feels consistent and correct because you've already established that before. Um, the downside to this approach is that you have spent effort, energy and time in doing something that you didn't need to do because you are now literally painting over it. I don't have a solution to what the correct way to approach this is. Just thought it was an interesting observation. All right. So I'm going to switch to a more accurate brush now because I don't want these last steps to be all over the place. Um, and I'm going to water down some of this orange. And we're going to actually start to push it into the areas where rust gathers. So using stippling first creates a hard, dried looking rust. Using the watered down um, diluted oranges creates a more streaky, grimy, uh, sort of rusted look. The two, in my opinion, need to be combined to create a really effective rust. Great. This is looking great. I'm liking this. All right. Cool. Uh, so we'll go into a final bright orange. And this time we're going to be uh, tempting to be more precise. So to go back to our original discussion about metals, they're always uh, one of my favorite things to paint because you have the challenge of thinking about light and thinking about how to make all of these surfaces talk to each other. Um, you have the challenge of uh, painting a, a, a surface in a, in a different way that you wouldn't normally, um, you know, versus, you know, cloth, skin, etc. You start thinking about things in a completely different context, which makes it, you know, fun to be challenging your brain into not just going on autopilot and going, yep, got to you know, visualize how this is going to work and what do I need to do, etc. Um, but what yeah, what, what I feel like is the most fun part of this is, is that moment 
when you get someone else looking at it, you go, whoa, I can't believe you painted that uh, to look like metal. It's when, when you get the technique right, when you get people feeling like this is metal and it's not reflective paint, oof, great feeling. So I'm going to pull out the hairdryer and I apologize again for those people who don't like the hairdryer. Uh, it is an invaluable tool in the arsenal that you need to all start using. <laughs> Do it. I'll take this off screen. So let's go on to the final step of uh, this rusty trombone is again to just go back in and bring it back the high contrast. Doesn't look like metal unless you've got high contrast. Sometimes that means you create a contrast between a rusty surface and an area that's right beside it. So we can do that by re-emphasizing the lights uh, we can do that by maybe popping a little light alongside some of this rust. Do that by reinforcing the shadows again. And all of these great variety of options. This is looking pretty good and feels like an interesting uh, metal. Got lots of different colors reflected in there. And we've got 
really bright lights. We've got some deep shadows. I think we'll probably reinforce a few more shadows with some black. We've got rust, we've got streaks, we've got focused highlights. We may come in and just reinforce some of these highlights again. Just in this area here. So I think I said at the start, like there's there's many, many ways you can paint metal. Um, a lot of these techniques that I've just gone through for non-metallic metal actually works just as well with true metallic metal because what you're doing is, um, is you're thinking about the surface and the object and the way that it reflects light. Um, just because you have an object that is already reflecting natural light doesn't mean that you can't give it a little nudge, give it a little hand um, and help draw your viewer to where you want them to see the lights. Um, you know, placing, placing a little bit of white paint into a metallic colour um, for these last highlights will help uh, lock in a highlight so that it's always visible, even when there isn't a lot of natural light, uh, which can work really well. Uh, so yeah, it's not just not just the non-metallic metal technique and consideration. All these factors here are just as just as relevant for true metallics. Okay, let's go. And we'll just finish by adding some little little scratches and then some little dark shadows again. So Here's an easy one to think about, forget about with scratches, but because uh, of with the way we hold a model, we tend to do scratches always in the same direction. <laughs> so to make sure you're doing scratches on all directions, vary the length and the shape of your scratches. Anyone got any questions about any part of this approach? 
understanding the volumes. I mean, I sort of thought to myself when I got onto the stream today, yep, this is going to take me, you know, probably a good solid two to three hours to knock over this leg. And then I go and finish it in like 50 minutes or something. <laughs> is what it is pal <laughs> if you want although I'm probably going to try and finish the whole figure in this sort of style. Oh, let's maybe do a let's maybe do a little freehand symbol. Um, I did get this out, and so let's uh, let's utilize this particular um, piece of artwork to have a little conversation. So the cool thing about this is you really get to see uh, white in action. Um, and, and where your position as a viewer is. Now, when you're talking about a piece of artwork, it's a two-dimensional shape. So you don't have to worry about someone turning your model around and looking at it at a different angle. So you're always going to have control over where your viewer is looking. And that's why non-metallic metal is a two-dimensional technique, um, not really three-dimensional. So we've got a... Uh, directional light source here and if we look at this um, knee pad we can see that that light source is all the way up the top here coming from this direction so that's a that's a valuable um, you know piece of information to have so what we can then do is look at each of these objects and surfaces and, and understand why they've been lit in the way that they have so if we look at these objects here, because of the position that we're standing, we, we aren't seeing the actual main light. We're seeing the bounce light. This light here is the main light, the one that, you know, in, in artists would call it rim light. Um, but this is actually the main source of light. And so if we look at all of these surfaces here, you can see that's edges, which is exactly what I talked about here so we're catching uh some light bouncing back along this line now again let's go back to contrast here is a dark line right beside a light line so we're getting much more contrast here is a spherical object as a viewer we're slightly above eye level like we're looking slightly down on this model and so this here is an example of uh, the light being uh, probably a little bit higher than where I would have normally done it. So I probably would have gone for here for my highlight on this leg. Um, there's not a, a massive amount of, uh, you know, really super light lights and that's probably something i can take away for for mine is you know, i've probably got a few too many areas of really high value light um but the placement the placement is the thing to look at so again we look at this directional light source and we come over here and we see this is in a perfect angle line with this space um down here we've got the same now here we've got a rim light along the side but we've also got this object here which is pretty much in line with where it should be when we consider that our position as a viewer is over this side that we're actually getting uh, this light more across than we would again normally think to highlight that so and this sort of this sort of you know, piece of artwork is really useful 
to to look at, to review, and understand how a two dimensional artist sees light and sees non metallic metal, and then how we can extrapolate that and think about that in a three dimensional format. Um, yeah, one other fascinating thing about this is how greenish the metal tones are. Uh, the reason I say that's fascinating is because you look at the environment. This is a greenish tone, and our metal's reflecting the greenish tones. So this is this is a great example of a lot of the concepts we're trying to bring in when we talk about um, non-metallic metal paint. So I am constantly learning, constantly understanding um, this this technique more the more I paint it. Uh, but I will say it is an absolute class to paint like this. I decided I'm going to add some more blue. So we're going to use this blue, a Leviathan blue. It's a bit darker, if you like darkening it up after looking at that artwork. Don't try this at home. Well, actually, that's not true. Try it at home. But maybe don't grab colours out that you've never used before try and do it on a stream. I don't recommend that. That's suboptimal. I don't think I'm going to post that to you, Frog Jim. I don't think that's likely to happen. guy's gonna look cool. Painted like this the whole way across. I wonder if I could have done the whole thing tonight. It's probably a decent chance. <laughs> what am I posting instead? I'll post you a crisp high five, my friend. that in the mail coming your way. This is a nice material to paint actually. I don't think I've painted a figure in this material before. I feel like it's some sort of plastic. Where is the box? Do you know? Yeah. What sort of plastic is it, friends? Someone tell me. Pre-assembled mini. Well, whatever it is, it's quite nice to paint on. Surfaces good for retaining detail. Takes the paint pretty nicely. I like it. Uh, things we'll we'll probably do on the next stream. We'll try and uh, we'll try and build up uh, some more of the rest of this in my spare time, and uh, we'll focus on doing the uh, glow coming from his chest, his chest, its chest, Robert's chest. Yeah. All right, 
I'll just give one final little demonstration on uh, a little painting here. So let's start with defining an object we can use. Let's go a cylinder. This is a very common object, unlike armor plates and so on and so forth. So let's pretend that we have a light source coming from here. So first thing we do is we define our main light. Now this light's coming from here, which means we're gonna see a main highlight main light here. Now if the cylinder is a perfectly smooth cylinder, this highlight will be the same width all the way down the cylinder. However, if you've got a slightly conical shaped cylinder, more like this, as is often the case with breast plates, as I said, or uh, fire guards and so on. And again, we've got this light source. And what we tend to see is a wider uh, light at the top, moving down into a narrower light down the bottom. So the second thing we see is a little bounce light, and that's usually alongside the first one. Doesn't have to be. Um, there. And then we want to put in some environmental light. So let's consider this line to be environmental additional light that we're adding to the surface. We build up our highlights along this line. Make sure we're highlighting the edges of the object. And we're constantly thinking about brush strokes. So this straight line like I just did then is usually not right for this type of object. We want to be going little sideways strokes. You can get away with it on smaller objects. And sometimes it helps to create a very clear line. Don't feel super constrained by this sort of stuff, by these sorts of rules. You know, sometimes it's nice to just add some little, little irregular shapes in your metal. because that'll help uh, give you the concept that there's other things that exist around your, your surface and your object. So now we move into greys and highlights. So the greys remind you that this is in fact metal object, which is mostly gray. I've done this on a much, much more abbreviated timeline. Uh, no airbrushing, but sure you get the point. Nice to add some scratches, little objects. And then our lights down. Ba -bam.
So this object doesn't really look like metal. And that's because this line is the same diameter as this line. And that shouldn't be the case. What should be the case is this line extends out much, much further because this is the actual color of the metal. We should only have small areas where we're seeing black. Using this as an example. And so you can see now how I filled in this more and all of a sudden we look like a metal object. All right, friends, that'll, that'll just about do for today, I reckon. Uh, it's been a glorious time painting this non-metallic metal leg and hopefully doing some uh, something a bit different than what I've done in previous streams. So I am back again next month uh, where we will, as I said, continue this uh, and hopefully do some wonderful OSL object source lighting and uh, continue that on non-metallic metal. Thank you all friends. Have a wonderful day. Good luck to you all.